I'm here to talk about Secure Coding uh, Practices Quick Reference Guide, which is uh, a new OWASP project. It's out available on the OWASP site right now under the alpha projects, but that could change at any moment. It could move to stable release while we're talking. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on right now about how quickly we, it can be moved to stable release. So you'll either find it on the alpha tab or you'll find it on the main projects tab. Um, sometime between now and a few days from now, it'll migrate, and I don't know when that is. They're still trying to decide how fast things can get moved because everybody's here. So anyway, um, start. Yeah, yeah, this worked a second ago. Okay, there we go. A little about me, uh, so you heard some of that, uh, long, lots of letters stuff. Uh, basically what the ISO thing is, is that the uh, ISO standards committee that produces like 27,001, 27,002 is in the process of producing a large number of other standards that basically take the sections of 27,001 and 2 and expand those into their own standards, things like network security, uh, intrusion detection, incident response, application security. There are a whole new little army of standards coming your way in the next few years out of ISO around cybersecurity. Uh, I am one of the U.S. delegates that represents the United States' point of view uh, to the International Standards Organization, so I get to go and arm wrestle with delegates from other countries around the world who have their own agendas and their own priorities, and it's all just a big group hug when we're done with the blood and gore. Okay, the goal. So the Secure Coding Practices Quick Reference Guide uh, was designed to help developers, particularly development teams who are not um, already engaged in a well-established secure development lifecycle. Right, so if your team or your company has already implemented a strong secure development lifecycle, you've got good training, you've got procedures, you've got processes, you've got guidance, you've got standard coding libraries and managed code, if you've got all that, uh, you know, I'm not sure, you're sure why you're here unless you're here to speak, right? Now, if your company is like other companies and you're trying to figure it out, one of the challenges that I came across um, in my part of the job where, where I was going in and pen testing applications and my team was pen testing applications is we were having to deliver a lot of the same messages over and over to the developers and the developers frequently came back to us and said, why don't you tell us how to be secure to start with so you won't beat us up at the end? And even though we had secure development practices in place, um, we never had a really concise message, something that a developer could look at quickly and say, am I doing these things to make my application secure? And what are all the things I need to do to do it quickly and easily, right? So that was the goal. Produce something that I can hand to a development team that's short and easy to read and that they can understand in developer terms. So we originally developed this, my, myself leading it and my team, for Boeing. Uh, there was some industry interest that got generated, got, kind of got out and some people saw it and said, hey, this is really cool, can we get it released? And I started a negotiation process between Boeing Legal and OWASP, which was fairly painstaking and full of enough red tape to fill a truck. But eventually, Boeing agreed to release it, and as of uh, August of this year, uh, or I guess July of this year, late July, uh, Boeing officially assigned uh, copyright over to OWASP, so this is now not just an OWASP project, um, all the copyright uh, related to this project now belongs to OWASP. So everybody can share. All right. Um, so the guide uh, operates at a fairly high level. It's technology, technology agnostic, which means I'm not in the guide telling you, for instance, if you're writing your code in Java or if you're writing Cold Fusion or you're writing in C Sharp or whatever. It doesn't say in C Sharp do this, in Java do this. What it does say is it, it treats it more like coding requirements, right? So if I'm a developer and I go to my business unit, for instance, and they say, hey, build me a piece of software. They're not going to say, hey, I'd like you to do this in C Sharp. What they're going to say is, I need the software to function in this way. Go figure out how to make that happen. That's the way the guide approaches it. The guide says, these are the tasks you need to accomplish. These are the requirements that you need to meet. Essentially, the secure coding requirements that need to go along with the functional requirements. It doesn't tell you specifically how to do each thing. It just tells you what you need to do. And then you can go through it in the checklist and say, did I accomplish this? Did I do it? Right? So I also wanted it to be short. Right? So the entire checklist, this entire document, is actually only 13 pages long. And that includes basically a cover page and a table of contents page. Right? The checklist itself is only six pages long. And that's important because one of the things right now, if I want to go to a development team 
and I wanted to say, for instance, hey, you need to build something securely or develop securely, I have to hand them a book that's two to 500 pages long saying, here, here's software secure development, read this and come back with secure code, right? They're gonna look at that and they're gonna shake their head at me and go, Pff. So I needed something short that I could hand them and that they could easily digest, and that's what, that's what this does. At, at six page checklist format, and every checklist item is only one to two sentences long, that was one of the rules that we had going forward. Everything has to be precise, it has to be accurate, and it has to be short enough that they can quickly read it and digest it. Right? So it focuses on the requirements, not necessarily on how to do it. The other thing is, this document doesn't talk about vulnerabilities and it doesn't talk about exploits. So typically, if I'm trying to, if you have a, a book, for instance, there's a lot of great books on secure software development. If you hand that book to a developer, one of the things that they're first going to bump up against is that book is written in another language. It's written in securities. Right? It's not written in development language, it's written in securities. So a developer who's not familiar with secure coding is going to see something like cross-site request forgery and go, what? They're going to see SQL injection and okay, maybe they've heard that one. But they're going to go through those types of terms that we as security professionals hear all the time and they're going to say, first they're going to have to learn the term, they're going to have to build a context for it, then they're going to have to understand the concepts associated with it before they can even start thinking about what that translates to in a requirement and how to then meet that requirement. So this guy does not talk in security language with one exception. I do mention cross-site request forgery because it's, it's a very misunderstood concept, not only in the development community, but a lot of security people don't understand how it really works. So I do provide a very brief discussion on what that is, but that's the only security vulnerability exploit type of language you're going to see in this um, from that perspective. You're not going to see anything about cross-site scripting. You're not going to see anything about SQL injection. And the theory that I have behind this still to be proven is a developer doesn't have to un the developer itself the development team themselves doesn't have to understand security vulnerabilities or exploits to build secure software what they need to understand is what are the requirements that allow me to build secure software if I meet those requirements and then someone else has to come along and verify that those requirements actually did what they were supposed to do right so someone along that chain of creating a software has to verify and go through the verification process it doesn't have to be the developer though we don't have to teach them a new language okay <clears throat> so sections of the guide this is pretty straightforward uh, there's a table of contents, tells you what's in the guide. There's an introduction, which kind of gives you a brief overview of the guide. And it also uh, ties in some other OWASP projects. So if there are other OWASP project leaders in here, you notice for some projects I mentioned some specific relationships to where the guide fits in versus where some other OWASP projects fit in. But I don't go through every OWASP project, right? So I, I give kind of a summary of here's some, or some related topics that might be useful to you as a development team. Here's the links, go out and look at them. But realistically, um, there's an entire framework of OWASP projects that can be put into place that all can support and supplement each other. So if you're uh, an OWASP person and I didn't put your project in here, it's not because I don't appreciate the value. It's just I think that's a, much, that's a whole topic by itself, right? A whole presentation by itself. Uh, the other thing is software security principles. This was another thing that we faced was when we went to talk to development teams, they had, in some cases, a very little or very basic understanding of security. I mean, not just secure coding, but of what are the security principles that we're trying to address with secure coding. So I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how could I boil down into one page of introduction to security principles, IT security principles. And that's what the, the uh, software security principles overview does. It's only one page long. It goes through, uh, talks about confidentiality, confidentiality, integrity, availability, talks about risk management and understanding what risk means. Uh, it, it talks about the difference in perception between a developer and an attacker. Uh, for instance, like the, a, a development team is trying to meet functional requirements to perform a business task, where an attacker is trying to see what an application can be made to do, not what it was designed to do. Right? So it introduced some concepts like that that developers probably haven't heard before. But it's very brief, again, only one page. Then you get into the secure coding practices checklist. Again, six pages, only one or two sentences for each checklist item. That was one of the rules. And we may have one or two in there that are three sentences long, but in general, one or two sentences. We also provide links to uh, additional resources at the back. So again, 
don't link to every resource, and I'm not trying to show vendor preference or resource preference here. I mean, there's lots of good resources on the web. I wanted to provide a starting point, some samples of places you could go. So it links to OWASP projects. It links to things like the CWE, to MITRE. Uh, it links to um, the Department of Homeland Security's uh, Secure Coding uh, uh, webpage. Um, it links to some of the uh, Securenia or other uh, places where you can find out, for instance, if you're going to deploy software, you're typically deploying that software in the context of some type of framework or on a web server of some type. It, it gives you some resources so you can go out and find out, does the environment you're going to deploy your application in have any currently known bugs you should be aware of? Right? So that's another thing that, that should be a part of the development lifecycle. Not only are you building your code securely, but once you get to the implementation phase, is the framework, the servers, the rest of the architecture supporting the application secure? Right? So are there known bugs that you should be dealing with that were actually outside of your actual development project? Uh, and the glossary of important terminology, the glossary is two pages long, and it basically, um, if there's a, for every section of the guide, it, there's a glossary definition that says this is what this section is. There's also a lot of key terms in there. If they're terms that um, we felt would not be immediately understood by a developer or where there was a possibility of misunderstanding what that meant, we put the glossary together so that the developer would understand in a security context, this is what that word means. So that when a developer is talking to their security support staff or to the, maybe their development team has their own security review person, when they're doing that, um, they're talking the same language. Again, because this language barrier thing is a real thing. I don't know how many people have, uh, how many people out there have had, had do testing against applications? Do you have, how many testers do we have out here, right? How many times do you go to developers and you try and explain something to them and they're looking at you with their, de their eyes glazed over and they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? And so then you have to go into explaining what does this terminology actually mean so that they can, they can get their head around it. Because conceptually, they'll be able to understand it. It's just new words, right? I mean, it's if I start speaking in German to you, some of you, a lot of you are probably not going to understand what I'm saying. It's not that those words don't have meaning. It's just they're new to you and so you don't understand them and I have to explain the context. All right, so these are the sections of the checklist. The sections are designed so that you could take a look at what your functional requirements are in your application or functional areas of your application and, and you could go to those areas and say, am I doing something? Like, am I taking, uh, am I taking user input, right? So then you go to data validation, talks about the, how to handle data validation. Uh, am I gonna do authentication? Talks, talks about what the thing's in authentication. So it breaks it out into these areas. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have a, anyone have a junk drawer in here? like in your kitchen or somewhere, right? It's like all the stuff you don't really have another place for but that you don't want to lose, so you throw it in your junk drawer. So the general coding practices, which is the fourth one from the bottom, is the junk drawer of this, uh, of this document. It's stuff that was important, shouldn't be left out, but doesn't really fit well into categorizing and I didn't really want to create a whole bunch of like two item categories. So the uh, general coding practices is the document junk drawer and so you could probably relate to that. So these are, these are areas that we felt were important. Broke, the, broke out all the stuff so you can go in and you can look for each task you're doing and say, how should we do it? Or what should we do, I guess. Uh, again, the checklists are short and to the point. Uh, straightforward, do this, don't do that. Uh, some practices require coding solutions. So for instance, uh, data validation or data sanitization or encoding, those routines, you don't want typically your development team rolling one off for every application, right? You want to come up with managed code that you deploy in a standard way so that most of your applications are using a controlled set of code that you already know does the, does the job well and does it securely. So one of the things you want to do is look at do you have, which solutions can you either uh, get from like OWASP using the ES API project for instance where you already have managed code that can do the job for you, where might you have to roll your own because uh, it's something that isn't covered there. Um, and for things that don't have uh, can't be managed, right? Like, like there's some things that you, you aren't going to be able to roll out code for. And you're going to have a practice, right? You're going to say, you, this is how we should like to have things done. That comes down to providing guidance. In some cases, you're not going to be able to have standard libraries for every solution, but you could produce um, guidance that helps the developers understand what it is they're trying to do, right? And how to do it specifically for their implementation. 
some practices are conditional. For instance, uh, there are some statements that say, understand the risk, the business risk, to, or the user risk associated with your application, because in some cases you may want to elevate your authentication to two-factor or multi-factor authentication, right? That's a conditional statement. A lot of applications are not going to 